Alright. Hello, hello, everybody. How you doing out there? Ah, oh, thank you everybody who's coming in early here today. It is Monday. And this is our regularly scheduled time for your favorite live retro show in the mornings. And that is The Bunker. The newest sensation to arrive to YouTube. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to start off with some wonderful shout outs here to the early arrivers. First off, Mega Cards and then Akiyama Ricky. Thank you for coming. The legged one. Thank you for being here. Brian Harmon. Thank you, as always, for coming. So Soren Lion. Thank you for coming to your first live show. That's great. Hope you enjoy it. Zero sleep. Hello. Zero self-elected. Hello. Overclockwise. Hello. And my good friend Delusionals Arcade, a.k.a. Dell. Thank you for showing up here today. I appreciate you being here. That's awesome. All right, guys. I uh, have an agenda here. Uh, first off, no, this show is not daily. This show is normally Mondays. And Thursdays, it's pretty fresh, it's pretty new, just started it. Uh, we're up to episode four, I believe. I kind of got myself confused. Let me see what we are at. Number four, right, yes. So we are up to number four because I had a number zero and I'm, I'm constantly forgetting like what, what exactly I've been doing and uh, the numbering. So it's kind of, I've confused myself more than anybody else but the show is called the bunker twice a week where we get into all kinds of retro stuff and we do have some reoccurring segments and i have an agenda as i said before with those segments but first off if you are here please do me a gigantic favor and that is hit the like button if you're able to because that really does help the push and reach of the show course we're here in the middle of the day so it's difficult enough to get people fired up on a monday morning about things so we're gonna try to bring some fun and good things to your monday and if you could just please drop that like for me if it's possible and if you're the kind of person who shares stuff that's cool too uh, but I said this before in the last episode every time somebody clicks the like button that translates into about nine or ten additional views and on a live show like this that's brand new it is really helpful so i'm sorry to sit there and kind of plug that a little bit uh, but that's the truth and that's the beast we are all working with here on youtube so first off i wanted to give a special shout out to the show's sponsor and that's all of you lovely folks over there on the retro tech Patre patreon page <laughs> and supporters of the show there. You guys are great. And gals, I love helping and working with you all on all your CRT issues, sharing things on the Discord and things like that. So I appreciate your constant support and your obvious sponsorship of this show for the time being. And uh, today, we have, again, as I said, some re reoccurring segments. So as the crowd starts to show up, we're going to get into some of these segments. And uh, the first thing I kind of wanted to go over this morning was um, to adjust my... Let me turn that jazz down a little bit. First off, before I get too, too far into things, let me show you the CRT. Okay? <laughs> oh, yes. So if you're at work... I love seeing you here, too. If you're actually supposed to be working and you're hanging out watching this, that's really cool. Ah! Snuffer stuffer, sorry. You know? It's a small price to pay. Alright, this is our lovely CRT. Spoiler alert. It is in S-Video mode right now. And, um... It's glorious. Really opened up my eyes on how wonderful these little TVs are. And something like today's modification is so, so simple that um, if I ever, I mean, 
if you're ever restoring one of these sets, it, it's almost absolutely uh, so easy to install the S Video mod that if you have the parts available, you might as well do it. So again, this model is the Sony KV-8 AD-12. And uh, so that's the main thing we're going to be going over. And that's our big star for the show. Okay. It's going to be running here. It's got what we call the best worst console in the world attached to it in its native S video format. And uh, so there we go. N64, baby. All right. Well, the show's been rolling here for about seven minutes. I know the audio is good. I know everything seems to be working right, and it seems to be a great time to transition into our first segment of the day, returning by your popular request and demand. It's time. It's time, everybody. That's right. It's dad jokes with your boy, Steve. So, as many of you know, I have acquired quite the collection of dad jokes here in my lap. And um, I'm going to go through a couple of them with you. And I think for today's inaugural issue or um, official starting, we're going to go through and maybe do six of them. This seems like a good number six. Okay. First up. Did you hear? Did you hear the joke about paper? It's terrible. Thank you, folks. Now I just need like a drum roll. I'm going to try to get, uh, you know, maybe I can get a couple more fancy special effects here. A couple more buttons sound effects for you guys did you hear did you hear about the restaurant on the moon great food but no atmosphere oh I can almost hear the crickets out there or maybe it's the crickets that are down here in the bunker basement with me I don't know thank you folks have I run off the whole audience yet this is either the best or the worst segment in the history of live shows. Now why? Why can't you have a nose 12 inches long? Because then it would be a foot. Get it? A foot? Of course you get it. You're in a brilliant audience out there today. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? Because the P is silent. And look, this one's awful, okay? This one's probably the worst one. But I told the one under it first, last time, so... I guess because pterodactyl has a P in the front of it, so... Can't even get that joke! Unless you're a brilliant audience like all you folks out there this morning. All right, our last category is what? What? What did the Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. Uh, the Zen. Dylan, I'm reading it. And, uh... Fat boy, I'm reading it too. But guess what? That doesn't mean I have to stop my lovely agenda to get to your chat. My goodness. If you want that, you have to do the normal thing and throw a dollar in there or something, right? Isn't that what it's called? Super chat? What do lawyers wear to the court? Lawsuits. But I'm bump. 
That's it, folks. Thank you very much. You have survived today's dad jokes. And so let me know what you think. Lovely way to start off today's episode, right? <laughs> Peace be to you, fat boy. Fat baby. Peace be to you. <laughs> I don't know if I honestly don't even know. The chat's really for you guys to talk amongst yourself. And I'll check in with you too. Absolutely. And there are episodes of times when we will do chats and questions and answers. But that's not on the agenda today. <laughs> All right, folks. So that that gets us through part one, and um, we're going to jump on over here, and I want to do a follow up. So, in case you uh, lived under a rock, I'm sure if you've been watching the channel, you know uh, the right here, the most recent one was this one. The Reflex RF Adapter. Right there. The Reflex RF Adapter. I want to do a little bit of an, uh, a follow-up on that. I had some interesting questions and comments about it. So here's the deal. Uh, this is what the final product looks like that. Like this. I know I didn't really reiterate that in my, um, in my review video. I just showed my prototype here. Which has a hard, you know, printed case. But this is not the finalized case. This was an adapter. It was actually sent to me a few months ago. So that's what I've got here is the adapter. Uh, but the case won't look like this, obviously. Okay. And if you are, um, look, I don't, I'm not getting anything for also for you guys. If you, if just so you know, I don't get like any deal with him on this. I just think it's a cool product. There's obviously other ways you could do this. If you have a solution already. Obviously, you're set. But if you're looking for a solution in a device that's small, you may want to go in here and, and e get the email notification because I know he said that he had uh, told me that he's a couple week weeks away from receiving a final shipment of uh, like the first round of units. And once those come in and pass, you know, his checks and balances right there they'll be available and the people on the email list will get the first notification and i'm sure once they're gone they'll be gone for a little while okay so again this is a it's a really convenient effective way to get this uh rf out of this composite audio or composite video and audio that's stereo okay and so that's it the reflex adapter if we have some extra time here today i may like um i did i did plan to possibly open this thing and show you what it looks like on the inside because i didn't open it up on the video so that may be fun so if if people are interested in seeing more of that let me know i'm i'm, I'm telling you right now the things that i can't do is i can't read the the chat when i'm actually talking about things and actually reading stuff here so um, again if you have a question i'll get to it but i can't i can't do it right now uh right here if you need something like this and again if you want me to i can open this up but again uh let's go through the uh, official sony first <laughs> yeah i think it's something that if if you have like a TV already or a desire to somehow incorporate an RF TV. I will tell you this thing is really handy with something like I used in my video, which was with this because this, you have to send in a signal in a very odd manner. You know, you, you get a little, let me show you, where is it? This little adapter here, and then it plugs in to the back antenna and it gives you a coaxial input on these old portable TVs like the Watchmen series. And that is how you get 
a coaxial in here, and then you could send in. And it's really only, you know, this is only novelty stuff, right? But you could send in your RF, or you could send in your composite video and audio through there, and it converts it to RF out the back, and then you plug that in there. And that's, and then it, and then you just tune this to channel three or four, and it works like flawlessly. That's how it worked in the demo video. That's a really, uh, cool thing if you just have those like to play with watchmen's for some reason and i don't know yeah some of the sets will be super clear with the rf tuners that are built into them it's because like that's all the state the uh signal they were working with back then so they did their best to make it look really really nice so it's just if you really want that it's a good option and anyway Let's go now to our main event here, folks. I've put it off for 15 minutes. We'll go ahead and get into it. And... Hey, Grail. Hey, Don Honk. Yeah, it's... it's That's the thing. If you were able to get one of these kind of things back in the day from Radio Shack, those ones are going to be good. But we're talking about now, there's not really a place making them new. So it's much easier to go order this when it comes in and get it shipped to you and you know it's going to work it's going to be designed specifically with game ring in mind and uh there's um sorry i was looking at the chat to see what that guy was asking about something about transformers non-uniform transformers no i mean you just got to keep with the transformer that you got in your tv Try to find a replacement by scalping another TV, I guess. It's really, or, you know, taking the parts from it. So if you're still here, there's your answer. Sorry about that, folks. Anyway, um, that's enough about the reflex. If you want me to, we have time. Later on, we'll get through that. We're going to switch over. And we're going to jump into our main event. And that is on our Sony KV, folks. I told you this one... Um, I actually went over this weekend. I had the extra time. And this whole job took about eight hours, right at eight hours. And it took me that long to get this torn down, do all the restoration on the boards, clean everything, install the modification, put it all back together, test it, and, and be to this point. It's a lot of labor, really. But... It's worth it. And I'm going to show you the things I found here. But this is the set now. It's just been running here perfectly. And we'll get to look at it a little closer here in a second. Again, this is the Sony KV-8 AD-12. And we're going to always start where we should. And that's with the documentation on this. We're going to flip over here and look at uh, the CRT database. Okay, so if you need to find out more about this television... You can find it on the CRT database. That's where I've referenced everything for this work uh, today. It has the service manual. It has some very good tips here about how it works, adjustments, and some special notes. The first things you can note about this TV is it has the 250 TV line tube that is in the Sony PVM model 8041, 8042, 8040s. Um, so that's, that's really nice. It's got a really nice tube. So if you had one of these that was busted, you can maybe keep it for the tube. And if you had, uh, if you have one, you can tell you could get a good image from a 250 line two resolution tube that this is this small. The S video mod is documented here. It's pretty simple, but there's not a lot, you know, documented here for it. It's just. You're soldering in a point here, and a point here, and a point here. But, let me make sure I can go back there. There's a little bit of directions. You can upgrade this chassis with this video. Simply connect your Luma signal to the input pin for composite video. And connect your ground to composite. And then connect for the chroma. Chroma is this spot over here. That's So you're basically just robbing chroma from here. You're injecting chroma there. 
you're injecting Luma right here into the composite video, and that's where your sync's going on. And then over here is just a ground point. Okay? Thank you, girl. Okay? So that's an explanation on how this mod works. There's no OSD on here, so you don't have to do anything with the with the OSD. You literally just inject the S video video. And it overrides and just shoots it straight into the TV. And so on the video input, it just acts like it's got composite on. So as long as you have the input put, as long as the video, oops, sorry about that, folks. That's the wrong one. As long as you have the TV set here where you have, you know, like the video on, it's thinking it's in, uh, it's just getting the video in, but you don't have to do anything else with it. All right. So there's no like, it's pretty basic television inside as far as logic. There's no, actually no OSD in this one, which is probably why you can't do the RGB modification to it. It's all uh, manipulated manually. So if we get back here to the dashboard, let's look at my file of uh, photographs from the one I worked on. And I did a live stream. Hey, Belmont. How you doing? Good to see you today. Hope you were... <laughs> Hope you're doing all right. Oh, those, uh, those rich people don't like you. <laughs> don't like you using your loud and effective equipment. Unfortunately, huh? Sorry to hear about that. Thank you for stopping in. So the first thing I did, I did have a stream where I went through and I serviced the power supply on here. That was the last episode of the bunker. So that's the Thursday show. Now, it doesn't remove the ability to do composite. If we just don't put composite in, or if we just don't have S video going in, the composite will just work like it does normally. Okay. So this is the neck board. Uh, very basic neck board. There are some key elements. You have potentiometers up here that allow you to make adjustments to your colors. That's what all those are. That's the back side of the board. I removed all this shielding and plastic and cleaned and reflowed the solder on this board. And that's just another image of that board right there. Cleaned. This is way cleaner. Sony left a bunch of flux residue on these boards. It's kind of nasty. Uh, but that's it. There's no... If we go back and look at the front of that board, there's actually no components uh, that wear out really on it. Now, if you had a problem with your color on this, you could check these resistors right here. One will be for each color line right here, one of these big resistors. But there's no capacitors here. The biggest issue on with this board is solder and solder quality and how it breaks down over time. And this one is a 30-year-old television. Okay. So those are the rest of the boards all pulled. It's kind of bundled together. And hey, Mid Geek Crisis, Mid -geek Crisis thanks for coming in. TR24. You know, the TR24, I can't remember which one, um, which one that is, because I've done a couple other mods to that 13 inch. I don't know if it's the, I might be the TR24 was one of the ones I actually modified before. And it might be able to do RGB. Uh, I do believe it talks about that over here on the website. A little bit. Before, um, so you may want to check out the CRT database and see what it says about that model. Hey, 6.5. All right. So this is the, the whole board. And it's like this, this little TV all packs out into this one board down here. That's the major board with your deflection and, and power. Also down there, this is like power areas and deflection starts over here under these weird heat sinks. And this is all jammed right under the back of the television, this transformer. And I went through and I found all the bad capacitors. Yeah, it's a white kitchen one. Oh, yes. Okay. No, no. Actually, that one, you're right. That one can be S video modified. Um, and uh, you know what? That one might be. I think I was told that that one's S-Video modified and that one will knock out the composite video on it if you do it. 
But there is information about the TV. I actually have that one, but that's the one I've not modified. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Because the other ones were black that were the 13-inch that actually do let you have uh, RGB in them. All right, so the bad capacitors were marked up here. Most of them were right against this heat sink and then around this transformer. And these other capacitors are super nice. They're 105 degree, high quality caps that were reading super low on the ESR meter. That one's not, but I replaced this one. This was a 70 or 85 degree, but it got replaced, you'll see. Um, but those power caps are super good on there. And this is what it looked like. Uh, I did have to get, this was kind of a pain. I did have to get under here and remove all these caps under that and then reinstall them that that yeah as samuel finally finally s video mod for you so we're making it through the restoration process first here's just a couple pictures of this board uh, again these other caps are in these areas that weren't removed are really low microfarads 28 that's it the 28 is the one that you can do thank you zero sleep uh but the ones that are left in here are 50 volt one microfarads and read really low in the sr meter so they're not bad at all same thing with these uh this is not capacitor juice that's leftover flux residue from the plant installation i will show you some capacitor juice here in a second but that's what it looks like with those capacitors removed on the other side of that heat sink. This is the spot. So this is the horizontal width coil. And you literally have to stick a tool down in that coil, down in that point right there, and spin it to get horizontal size adjusted. But you only want to do that with a plastic tool. And I think it's even got to be a six-point tool or something. It's not a normal screwdriver. Or you'll break it, and you don't want to break it, then you'll lose your horizontal size, and it'll get all bad, okay? So if your horizontal size is good, just don't even mess with this thing. But you will notice down here, we do have a bunch of nasty stuff. What had happened down here is this capacitor, C, I can't remember, it's 819, I believe, had some leakage, you can tell right here, by that positive sign. But the real bad one was on the other side of this heat shielding right here, and there's only one visible hole here this one had spewed its guts all over these jumpers thankfully they were just jumpers and it didn't really hurt them i just had to clean them and then this little I think this was a diode right here yeah diode and uh that had exploded down there and that's the back side of the board where i removed all that stuff and if you see yellow residue there that's that's how sony would leave it like all that nasty residue that flux residue so hope you guys are doing well again if you're here today i really appreciate it i know the show started a bit goofy i must have made some people upset sorry about that literally just having fun and uh appreciate it if you do me a favor again if you haven't already hit the like button sorry snuffer stuffer i know you did if you haven't already hit the like button i will let some more people know that we're live here today on the bunker. And that we're finally into the meat and potatoes of this. Great, thank you. Good. Looks like people are really having some help from some of this stuff, so... Guys, the point here, when you're servicing this TV, and things like this, you'll run into Sony products that look like this a lot. These double-sided boards. I will warn you, you need to work with extremely low temperatures, good solder that melts at low solder melting, right? Okay? Because uh, it doesn't take much heat to vaporize these traces. You have to be very careful. And I would recommend if you have to, if you really have to do it, you can, uh, you can go through and take the extra time to melt a little bit, dab of fresh solder on these before you remove any of these capacitors. And it will be helpful because you really want to preserve this board as much as possible because there's a lot of traces. You just don't want to break something and lose continuity and have trouble later as it's a bear to put these things back together. The other thing you need to do is just look for solder. There are some points on here that you'll want to reflow solder on. I'll show you what I did at the end. Uh, but, you know, the most important thing is to maintain the integrity of your traces and your holes. 
and to not knock any of the adjacent parts off. Okay? Right? Hey, Ronnie. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Samuel G. And, um... Let's move on to our next photograph here. So these were all the capacitors on the main board that tested bad, that were removed and changed. Now, I believe, let me see what I have here in my file. Fortunately, I don't know that I have many other photos. Before I get too much into that, let's look at this. Oh, there's some more. Of the All right, guys. So I, I did a really poor job of photographing the after, the after pictures here for the capacitor it reinstall, but that's all the capacitors I've zoomed in here and they're installed. You can tell that one's completely different. It's red and there's a couple of different brands in there. And when it comes to capacitors, it's okay to go up on the voltage. Sometimes I do that. I'll go up on the voltage and it's okay to go up on the temperature rating and things like that. It's just not okay to change that microfarad rating generally. So keep that same, um, you know, keep that same rating for your capacitor so it can actually do what it's supposed to do. But you can increase the voltage. Just don't decrease the voltage. All right, so this is going to be the S-Video modification part and the one, one thing I did. So I had... All right, here's what we got. Sorry, guys. I did a couple things here. I found this old board uh, that came with some type of a kit. Hey, Mark. Thanks for showing up today. Yeah, you guys love my cameras. Come on. <laughs> this, I have a better camera and it crashes the system and I'm terrified to plug it in now. One good camera, one mediocre camera. That's what we have today. All right. The, uh... The board, though, it's a breakout board, and I was thinking, how can I make this job clean and easy? Because I did have to cut a hole. So this little board was really handy. Again, I just found it from a prototype kit. And you just stick an S-Video adapter into it, and you can solder into it. Uh, on this side, you solder, and, and it's, it's just cleanly. I'll show you what it looks like here in a second. But the first thing I did was I salvaged an old connector for three pin and a three pin cable that I had from an old PVM. I just salvaged that little jumper cable and then this little junction off the board and I fit it. I was like, yeah, that'll slip in there and make it. Oh, photography. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would, but this was all salvaged parts. This was nothing I ordered. This came off the board. It's a three pin connector with the three pin cable from a busted salvaged circuit board. I desoldered it. I resoldered it in to this board. And then uh, before I get into that part, I'll show you, I'll show you what else I did with it. I, I then took that board, that, that was a really short cable, that junction cable. So I, Stole another junction off the board where it went into on this side, the three pin, and then I used that as my point here on my solid cables that went in for the modification. So those are the modification cables right there. They come out to this other breakout point, and that is how I got... Hey, Tony! Yes! You're here! Thank you. Thank you for your hard work, too. Getting out of surgery. So this is the little breakout cable I salvaged and used. And that was just to make it easier when I was putting all this together and cleanly putting this together. Now, there's that side. There it is ready. Obviously, the only thing I could solder in was that cable. I have to wait to solder in the S-Video port. And this is super tight, okay? There was not really any clearance. And any, there wasn't even clearance after I installed this initially when I tried to put it back together. Let me explain some more. Uh, what I had to do is, this S-Video mount right here, it is slightly over three-eighths of an inch. I mean, slightly over three-eighths of an inch. I don't even know. It might be the next millimeter measurement up, whatever's above that. Uh, so what I did was I, I didn't even drill a hole with 
this is some of the secrets you guys need to learn if you're going to do something like this and you want to not destroy the plastic. The plastic is fragile. Okay, the plastic is fragile. So if this is my drill bit and I go and I turn on my drill with power, even low power, it's going to come in here and jump and it's going to start going so fast it'll melt the plastic and it'll even sometimes hit something, crack, it could jump in that plastic. The secret is to simply take the drill bit itself and use it and your hand to drill the hole. You put slight pressure against the back of that case, okay? Sorry. You spit, you know, you're coming in, you set your point on the hole, and again, it has to be somewhere in this exact spot to fit between the neck board and then the base mount and then the sideboards. You have very little clearance. It's got to be pretty much right on there, almost intersecting that arrow, okay? And what you do is you come in and you drill your hole by hand, you slowly hit, take your time and just drill by hand, okay? Drill by hand. You just spin your drill, your 3 8 inch drill bit by hand and slowly carve out that plastic, okay? And then you still don't, you're not gonna get enough clearance to squeeze this thing in. So after that, after that, you take whatever method you're best at. I used an X-Acto knife and went in and cleaned up those edges that I couldn't get past the drill bit with and then uh, enlarged enlarged that hole more so that I could fit that in. You see how it has a little bit of a jagged look right there? Okay? And what that allowed me to do was um, I was able to get that hole basically perfectly rounded even though it looks like a little jagged there and it was like slightly slightly smaller than this the actual s video plug here and so i had to spend like 10 minutes slowly slowly pushing this input into the back of this plastic because it was so tight and i did not want to make the hole any larger on any side it was perfect i was like and i knew if i got it in and just got it through it doesn't slip at all like you have to push it in hard it doesn't even it's like it's like the right perfect size to where it doesn't need any adhesive now i am going to put a single drop of um uh, of sorry glue in there to hold it but it is so snug i'm telling you it, it came out perfectly and the good thing is that I didn't glue it, and I'll explain that because I did need to push it out. Like, I had to push the thing out like a millimeter for clearance let reasons. So, I got this all together. I soldered in the breakout board right there. And I know it looks like I'm zooming in so close. I know it looks like there's a bridge on there, but it's not, okay? That's cleaned up. That's what it looks like in the back. And uh, the other thing I had to do, guys, I had to come in here afterwards. I didn't actually get a picture of it, but I had to take an extra pair of snips, um, flush cutters, okay? I had to take these flush cutters, and this often happens on these prototype designs, but if you see this whole area, I'm going to outline it with my, uh, with my cursor, okay? Like... If I go in, that's as close as I can go. So I had to actually take my flush cutters and I had to trim this board down around all this extra uh, area of the the board itself, like the fiberglass, I believe that's what it is. I had to snip it on this side, on the bottom, and this side to just, just shave it down. And then, you know, you, you file the side a little bit so it would fit in the in the crt because even that was too big by itself so i had to trim all that extra away uh so even the end desired result it, it's still integral and working good because all the traces are coming up here in the middle and everything like the grounds are all looped on this one and then they tee up into the middle where it says gnd there so that was just another little trick i had to do But that's what it looks like. You could then, the good thing is, is I could just remove that cable. And now this is what it looks like if you ever have to remove the shell. 
Yeah, I was wondering too. I just didn't want to burn the plastic. My other idea, Snuffer Stuffer, thank you for saying that, was to actually go in and use a heat, uh, a hot air gun and maybe heat up that plastic to make it a little malleable, push it in and then let it cool. Uh, but I really hate stress in plastic more than you have to. Awesome. Yes, mid Greek mid Greek crisis uh, PCB way for an Atari X hundred eight eight hundred XL project. It gives a PCB to add S video jack. That's awesome. Yeah, that's. I thought this little thing looked great, and I believe that that's where I kind of got this was not from that because I don't have the. 800, but I believe it was a different Atari project from a long time ago where you could ask, add S video and I bought a few of the extra boards because I liked them, like the port uh, board, like that. So look for Atari 800XL S video port adapter. That's the tips. Yeah, sorry. I know YouTube is funny about sharing links. So there we are. We've got the S video installed and this is the other end of the cord, right? That's all it is. You unplug it there and you plug it in here. And I had to make this breakout here to just give me some fair space. You can see I've, the good thing is, is that has hard pins right there. I just connected our, um, cabling in there and heat shrink, use some heat shrink tubing on there. And then I have a double breakout point. Okay. For the modification. This was how I determined which was the chroma and luma, and ground is in the middle. Yeah, it would have been, uh, I wanted to have this like this and try it, Dell. I did, I did, but it was one of those things where you're like, ah, oh, Lee, it doesn't really fit, so I did trim it down, but thankfully. It didn't really cause the issues yet. No, after you get the job done, you're like, man, I don't really want to redo it. If it would have not fit at all, I would have redone it. Uh, but that's a closer look at that point of access. And this is the actual modification. And boom, I've busted myself. I'm actually using hot glue here. Okay. And sorry. Talk about cable strain relief. There's my cable strain relief. You see my big dab of hot glue right there? That's for the chroma line. Okay. So you're going to get the chroma line right off here. It's hard to see. Uh, I can't remember what the exact point is here. But there, I remember when I was looking on this board, I looked for this, which was R232. This resistor is R232 that I'm highlighting with my cursor. And if you come down... And you come over to this little capacitor here, and then there's a point, a little pad where a bunch of other, like another capacitor comes in. There's a there's a spot on there, and that's what you're sticking to right there for chroma. Chroma comes out there, raw chroma, or you can inject raw chroma there, okay? And then that's got some strain relief right there. And then same thing up here, I put a dab hot glue to strain relief. All right, and look, if we go up here, this is, so this point is our composite video input, and this point's just a ground, so we have to have ground, chroma, and then we're using Luma. Uh, I mean, we're injecting Luma through our composite video in, which is interesting, right? So we're just injecting raw Luma with no color into the composite. That's really how this mod's tricking and working. Do you understand? Because it's a very... It's a very simple, like, basic modification. You're basically just sending... From your S-Video device, you're sending straight Luma, which is the absence of color, right? It's the brightness, the gray scale, and your sync information. That's all coming down the composite line, and then you're passing all the composite stuff, and you're going in, and you're injecting your straight chroma in. And that's how you're going to get the better, uh, that's right. Inject that raw chroma right in your veins. <laughs> thank you, Edgar Paws. I hope so. Corpse one. Thank you for showing up. Uh, so that's really in, I believe the most, what do we want to say? 
layman's terms, how this mod works, like what it is, because it's not extensive. There's no logic being involved. You don't even have to have any kind of like the signal can come in straight from your device. You don't even have to do anything to tune it or add any kind of uh, resistors or anything for this specific modification. It all just works. Okay. So that's the bottom side of the board. And that's probably the only picture I have of the bottom side of the board, but you can tell. Remember how nasty it looked before I serviced it? I don't know why I didn't take more pictures of the bottom side of this board. I did have to reflow solder on a lot of points. It's these big points here where there were the connections, all the transformers, the flyback transformer, anything that looked dodgy, uh, the inputs, anything there would be strain relief on too, or to add, I'm sorry, where there would be strain. Like if you insert a, a RCA cable, it's going to put strain on that joint. On that weld. So all that's reflowed. Yeah, this is a real simple one. So I'm telling you, the most, the trickiest part about this is taking your time and not damaging things. Another thing that took a lot of time was actually disassembling and reassembling this little, this little TV. It was very difficult to get all that stuff kind of out and in a compact space right. And you don't want to accidentally knock something and damage it. That's the most uh, stressful part is doing all that at once. So we're going to take a quicker look. Uh, we're almost through all these pictures, I believe. Let's, let's see what we have left. And there's a closer look. Oh, good. Look at that. I got this beautiful higher resolution that you can actually read. So this is the point of entry. That's my weld. Look at that. This is about the clearest picture I ever had available for you guys. Um, but there's that R232 I was telling you about. See how you go there? And it makes this like Z. Right angle turn. And then you have this pad with nothing on this point right here. The other side, it's the bottom side of this L201 inductor. See that? I believe that's the point right there. L201. The bottom side of that. Close to this 218 marking. And that's where you're going to send in the raw chroma. And there's my gloop. Yeah, and then, guys, this is the perfectly appropriate amount and spot and everything to use this. Because if you ever wanted to get rid of this mod, you could just undo it. Peel this glue off, and it's not even on a trace. There's nothing. It's not going to have any effect on it. Okay? Very little amount. And uh, it's just meant to hold that cable. So if you pull on this part of the cable, then it won't go boom and first just put all the stress on this weld and rip it. That's really the point. And there's a closer look at the other welds. Okay. And here we have some finished pictures of uh, how this all looks, okay? It worked right away. I just plugged it in, plugged in the S-Video, and it works. And there it is all reassembled. You can tell there's a lot, there's a big compact design here. But this is the A20. That's the same tube from those PVMs. It's a good question about the yokes. I'm not sure that the yokes are the same. I would imagine they're pretty pretty similar, if not exactly the same. I should have thought about that. I should have... Oh, well, I've got the part number. Thank goodness. Clear as day right there. There's the yoke part number, so I can reference that. See if that matches. So there's my little cable. See how there it is coming out of there? The mod cable. See how it goes up there? Following my cursor into my breakout point number one and then off into the back of that board right there where I'm sending in straight S-Video on the back of that shell. And there it is. Revenge. Hey, from Denmark. Thank you. Shorter. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. I said it terribly wrong. Probably Steinholm. Thank you. Thank you for stopping in today. I know I saw you here in the last episode. I appreciate you coming back. All right, there's my hot glue gun. Busted, guys. Totally busted. 
And that's pretty much all there is to this modification. Like I said, I had to end up trying to trimming that board down. Oh yeah, overclockwise. Now you're in my wheelhouse. They did absolutely always have the very best wrestling games. So that's it for the photographs in this file. That's all of them. And Tony, who was here, I don't know if he still is. It's actually his it's actually his TV, which is pretty awesome. So he's uh he's gonna get it um he's gonna get it back soon and get to enjoy it. <laughs> Alright, so this is the TV right here. Uh the remote works fine, like no problems, right? See? Volume works fine. You just plug that in the same spot. You just plug that into this. The audio works the same as if it was video uh, RCA. Okay, so let me turn this around for you now. And um, we'll look at the back of this because that's pretty interesting. So there's the S-Video input, just right there. And that's really all there is to it. TV cleaned up nicely, it's been running awesome. I, um, absolutely no issues with it. It does add, obviously, sharpness to the picture. And, you know, it's just, it's just fun to do this with a little TV. Now I'm not going to make, you know, I'm not going to make you think this is going to look as good as the PVMs because it won't, it just doesn't have the same amount of hardware inside to give you the same kind of image. So the geometry is not going to be as good. The color is really good, but the geometry won't be as good as like the PVM or BVM. Color will be close, but not all the way there. The sharpness will be pretty close to the same. Uh, the deflection's not going to be the same. You're not going to get as good of a deflection on this either. So, um, Anyway. Very fun stuff. Cool little mod. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions about it. Someone's asked if I can add a VGA port to a tube TV. I mean, you could add a VGA port, it, it, depending on, like, you could make a S-Video style for VGA if you wanted to use the VGA style input. Uh, if you want to use that for RGB, you can too, if the TV say RGB capable. <laughs> oh, Brandon. At least some people are still telling the dad jokes. I don't know. The dad joke, whole dad joke segment might have fallen flat today. I think some people were like, oof. I think they must have been some bad ones today. The dad jokes. Let's see. Overall, it's pretty good. You know, it's really bright. The image is super bright. Pretty much got to turn it down a lot. Uh so I noticed about these old TVs sometimes. And then it... I've got it, the contrast turned down a lot, so you can see it better on here. But you can see a little bit of that wonkiness. You're not going to collect that, or correct that. You know? You're not going to get that perfect on these older sets. They're going to be more susceptible to... Um, corner stuff. <laughs> yeah, just go back to the beginning. It was the very beginning segment, Brandon. <laughs> that is the whole point of dad jokes, is to cringe. That's literally what it says in the book. Cringy. Cringy dad jokes. Fun little mod, guys. So if you, if you come across one of these TVs and want to have a project for the weekend, that's how long it took me, about eight hours to do it. Now that's, again, including the whole restoration. If you're just doing the modification... And you don't find any bad capacitors in your TV, you can get this done in like an hour and a half. 
There we go. Here we go. Grail's Hobby's jumping in too. What's another name for a computer virus? A terminal illness. There we go. Yeah, baby. All right, guys. So there's the uh, there's the KV. Um, I probably won't write up anything else about this. I doubt I'll have a video coming on this specific one. I think these two streams have kind of covered this thing very well. I do want to say a huge thank you again to uh, Andy King and, you know, this CRT database. Having this documentation here is amazing, right? It's so much easier to come in, Google your TV, have this database show up. It gives you these tips on how to adjust it and be care and, you know, all these specs on the tube. You've got pictures of the set, what it looks like inside, and then you actually have the the linked service manual. And I know there's other places that are really good for this too, like... Uh, the uh the wiki the crt wiki but uh this was the one i used for this one because it had just all the stuff in one spot s video mods now if you do have uh if you do have different tvs the, he's got all kinds of different tvs on here there we go and by brands lots of them lots of different um models let's take a look for that sony i know I know that one is the one that you can't. TR28. See, it's not here because there's not a good mod for it. Is it? 13 TR24 was the one we were looking for, right? No, I don't think that, uh, like, this is a community effort. There's a lot of people that put into these kind of things, like the information. It's kind of like what I do. Anytime I work on stuff, I put in certain information. He just does it differently. His is probably better off as far as, like, a database is concerned than, um... And so, I mean, the fact that he's got all this here kind of takes a lot of the stress off me and other people trying to put these things together. Hey, Mo77, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Sony KV 34 XBR 910 widescreen has awful screen blemishes. Does that have an anti glare layer that can be peeled? Her brasso can be used to remove as well. Thanks in advance. You know, uh, there's not. Let's let's look up that one. I wonder if there's anything here about that specific CRT, the 34 XBR. Some it's, it's harder. Some of these models, once you start to get into them, are not as well documented. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if it has blemishes. The problem is if it if you for sure like if it looks like it's got blemishes, it will have. Uh, it's hard to get certain types of blemishes into a tube, right? So if there's things uh, like bubbling and other weird stuff, like um, peeling looking things or something in the screen, the only thing the screen should ever really be susceptible to that would be permanent if it's not, if it's just glass would be a scratch. So if it just scratches, that's... That's a sign that if it's just like scratches, it's probably just glass. But if there's this weird like chemical thing going on, then there might be a tube uh, layer on that particular one. Um, you may, it's, it's not going to be clearly stated really anywhere. I don't feel like even uh, Sony did a great job of documenting that on the other uh, monitors that have layers sometimes it mentions them sometimes it doesn't say anything about certain stuff like that and that was going to be some, kind of one of the things i was going to talk a little bit about uh, later on in the next official segment that was going to finish the show today but my advice to you if it looks something like it has sorry about that if it looks like it has some kind of chemical thing going on like a bubbling or a peeling effect it probably does have a layer and man, this is going to be a difficult one because it's such a large tube. You're going to have to remove that whole tube from the shell, unfortunately, to get in there and peel it out properly. Because you can't just like go in and start wiping it with chemicals. If you do that, it's just going to get worse. Because uh, there's the chemical overlay, or the if it does have an overlay, you have to be very careful in what you put on that overlay. Uh, that can damage the overlay. And that's what I mean. If you have like blemishes in it, it might be from some kind of cleaning material. I hope that was helpful. I appreciate your super chat a lot. I really do. 
How do CRTs have good black levels when the shadow mask is usually light gray? Well, it's, you know, that's all depending on the, I feel like colors and look of your background and your room and your, let's see, like your, your, your lighting element, right? Because if a tube's dark or gray, you, if you're in a black room, you're not going to be able to tell. Um, the lighter colored tubes are meant for a darker environment. Okay. And that's so that you can get a crisper whoops i'm sorry about that a crisper look at your screen and then the darker tubes are meant for more environments that will have more ambient lighting so that they appear darker and just get a darker level of things i hope that's helpful hey steve have you ever heard of low brightness and image quality from not too high G2 voltage, but wrong. DC bias on the anode or something? Oh man, I have no idea. That sounds like something very difficult. Um, yeah, you're getting to those points where you may want to try and see if you can test your tube, McMuffin. That's the kind of things like, if you know your tube's good, then that just might you know and you're uh, it's hard to test a flyback i don't have any tooling to test flybacks i believe andy king may have a flyback tester uh maybe i can have him on here and talk about it sometime so unchinga says that his de or hers or there's demo diamond tron had a chemical anti-glare soft size sponge and brasso did work on that <laughs> shadow mask <laughs> thanks yeah you know we get i get some uh i imagine most people are working now right normal people it's noon on a monday oh uh, let's see you just got done recapping your 250 Looks great, apart from the color bleeding. Color bleeding. Ooh, you're going to be stuck. Hopefully, I don't know. You might have to adjust your focus and your G2 voltage first to try to get that tuned up and your brightness. Man, I don't know. It's like, if you don't have very much color drive stuff, you're going you're gonna to be stuck adjusting with what you can, really. There's not a lot more you can do other than try to juice that g2 voltage up and when you do that it can blow out the picture and make it look foggy can do that when you increase brightness that's generally a, tie, a sign of an aged tube unfortunately steve have i ever tried buffering scratches out of co tree glass no i have not but you know what is it eight oh man there's a great video of somebody just did Eight Gadget UK or something. I can't remember his channel name. Goodness. I'm subscribed to his channel. Let me see if I can uh, find the channel. Uh, uh, it's pretty active. But he's a guy over uh, that usually does... All right, here it is. Here's the channel. I know the video's on here, so I'm going to flip over and show you. It's Gadget UK... And I believe it's a short video. No. Oh. Yes. It's this video right here. Okay. He's got, whoops, scratches on the CRT screen. And we'll just let it run here. I'm sure he doesn't care. I've talked to him before sometimes. So he's got some screen scratches here. Yes, that's the channel. And this is um, lo loca glue, okay? That's the same kind of stuff you used, I believe, to do the old school uh, the old school glue for those Game Boy screen modifications. You had to do the front lights and stuff. Oh, look. Also, take a check on Delusional's post. He just sent you an arcade forum post that's got, I'm sure, some information. 
But these have been the best um, things I've seen so far. I've, I've been waiting for a CRT to come through that I could try this particular method on with this glue that Gadget UK 164 did, but I have not... I've not tried that myself yet and I've not been able to do it, but that sounds like a fun thing to try maybe on a live stream sometime. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to, um, we're going to switch over here and last segment of the day that's been officially set up and give me a second to change things around on the set, but boom, look at our graphics, everybody. Who watches the Watchmen? I know, right? Who said I couldn't have happening graphics here on the channel? So I'm going to get things reset here for a second. We're going to talk about some things Sony did. Uh, before I got into this restoration I've been going over today with you, I was working on a... And that's what I do. I had to reset this camera. I was working on a Sony... Um, BVMD series and I noticed uh, as I went through and made the cap kits for the television or sorry the monitor Sony uh, first off here's something guys Sony never never marks whether a cap is bipolar or not in their documentation as a matter of fact, they give you barely any information on caps for like replacements. For example, you'll get the cap location, which is on a board like, for example, this board I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, let's hope. Let's see here. All right. My camera's glitching out a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Hopefully it'll come back to life and be okay here. Um, there we go. So this is the BD1. Let me see if I can get a little bit more light. There we go. And maybe I can uh, adjust this. And man, the camera's really glitching out. I think this one's just starting to like fail on me, this particular camera. So I apologize for that. We're going to make it through this, though. Um, I need to go in here and turn the camera controls back to autofocus. There we go and apply and then we will just our brightness a little bit. I'm going to show you a couple key things on this card. So this is, gosh, this, this camera is just really giving me fits today. Sorry guys. I know it's like glitching. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, I hope it doesn't glitch as bad on your screen, but it's glitching pretty great bad on my screen. So I'm going to try not to move it so much. So anyway, this this is littered with capacitors. This is a card that you use. It's an additional card for Sony BVM. It's the 21D card. And it's an input card that you use to add uh, additional inputs in your BVM. Okay? So this one will give you... Uh, three composite video inputs, and then a set of RGB inputs, but it can do RGB sync on green, R but there's no sync slot on here, okay? So it can't do, do like a standard RGB sync. It can do RGB sync on green or um, component video with this card, okay? But this card has a very common failure point that Save on Pat, you know, revealed... And I'm going to show you that. So if you ever have this card and you want to make sure it works good, you're probably 99% of the time going to have to change one single capacitor on here. And it's going to be this one I'm going to show you. And I'm not sure what it is, but this is um, this is what happens when you have somebody have miles and miles of experience with these, these things. It's this capacitor right here. C232. It is a... Surface mount capacitor, 35 volt, 4.7 microfarad capacitor. That one goes bad all the time, and it's like the Achilles heel for this card. Uh, anytime there's an issue, it seems like even if half the other caps are bad on this card, if that one cap's good, the card will work, and it'll do most of its functionality. 
So always replace that. But that's a couple of things I'm I'm um that you know who watches who's watching Sony? Who was watching Sony when they let him do all this stuff? Let me show you. It's probably gonna be difficult to see, but for example, when you get in here and you look at and it gets even more tricky when you look at these surface mount components, right? So if you look at some surface mount caps here with me, Sony will only tell you the voltage and the capacitance of the capacitor and then a 20% value range, like generally. And then you come in here and you've made your cap kit ahead of time and you realize this capacitor, this capacitor, and a few more on this board are bipolar capacitors. They were not marked on the service manual. So now you have to go order a second round of capacitors with bipolar capacitors. And that's generally why you always have to, unless you're using a documented uh, rewrite of the... I'm sorry if this thing's been running and just running sound. I don't know. Um, unless you are following a rewritten guide for a board like this, you're not going to be able to follow the Sony guide and just order your caps. Because again, you won't know which of these have surface mount or which of these i mean have bipolar caps and to be honest with you there was a couple instances where i would look at a card from the bvm and uh the cap list would say it was a surface mount cap and then i'd get over to it and it was actually a through hole cap like this one and it had a completely different value but it was listed in the manual as something else so you always need to be mindful of what's actually on the board. That's your best guide. And no matter what you do, servicing this stuff, you cannot just follow the service manual. And let's say you let's say you blindly went in and just said, hey, I'm going to recap this. And I'm going to order my cap kit based completely off of only the documentation. You do so, and then what if you, before you pay too much attention, you decap this whole board, and you realize, holy crap, there were some SMD caps in there. Then you're in a big, big pickle, okay? So, I'm trying to teach you these things so you don't have to have these same mistakes that I did, you know? Don't make the same mistakes I did before. Yeah, it happens all the time. There's, It seems like there's at least one to two bipolar capacitors in every single Sony CRT, and it's never marked in the documentation. So that's kind of it. That's it for the Who Watches the Watchmen segment for this week. Now, guys and gals, thank you all for uh, tuning in today. That's really pretty much it for the scheduled program. I mean, we're right at one hour, 15 minutes this is about an hour show on Mondays. Uh, just to hang out, I can hang out for a little bit and chat with you. Uh, but that's all I really had planned. And, um, it's, let's see, I actually have to travel this Thursday. So unfortunately we're going to have a break here where there's not going to be a bunker episode this Thursday. I'm going to have something planned. I've been trying to meet back up with Zez for a, an episode of the cathode ray podcast. And if I can get with him, that would be a perfect thing to have, uh, come out for Thursday and maybe he could, you know, post it then if we can get it done, I've just not been able to connect with him. He's got a new job and that's all been working uh really well for him but it, it's prevented us from really filming anything recently so maybe that can happen um otherwise i think i'll try to get something put together for a video for a friday release uh, i can't make any promises but i'm going to work towards that Wow, yeah, if you, if you go in, so there's a couple things here, and I'm not going to jump off just yet, guys. I had some conversation here about cap kits and things, and someone was JS. When making my cap kit, there were multiple caps that were not on the board or just completely different uh, for my Sony. Yes, that happens. There's Sometimes there'll be a board revision, and they'll get rid of parts altogether. And it's, yeah, I don't know, I don't think that there's 
a benefit to go back and then add the parts in the in the places where it's been removed. So I wouldn't recommend that usually. Uh, but that does happen. Sometimes the cap kits, like for example, the M series PVM, there's three or four caps that might not be in some that are in others. And you got to put them on the list, but put a, you know, a, hey, this might not be in yours. Sometimes the, uh, the, depending on the year the CRT was made, it could have a modification where there's a different value capacitor there. I always say go with what's in the CRT and on the board at the time you open it. Unless you know it's been changed and it's been changed to something wrong visibly. Man, all right, there you go. Go check out Dell's stream for Wednesday if you have time. He's a great guy with a lot of uh, CRT knowledge. And we're going to get together, Dell, and do a stream soon. All right, Grail, let's see. Steve, quick question. If you had a CRT that was just a little bit too dark, troubleshooting steps on that. If you mean uh, brightness and darkness on the screen. So there's one. Let me see if I can pull something up here. I think personally the best thing to do is to try to judge all this and see what the software can do on your TV first off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the 240p test suite and just kind of walk you through here a second. Kind of the steps I take and show you the pattern I use to do so. And because there's actually a method to this uh, whole thing here, and it would be much better for me to just pull up the pattern if I can. And oh yeah, so this is this is it. I'm going to show you now. We're going to jump over here to this, and yeah, okay. So if you get it in there, and again, if you this is the pattern I love to use, and. It's this, sorry, it's so tiny, <laughs> but it's the SM, SMPTE color bar pattern, okay? And if you press A on your controller, it'll take it from 75% brightness to full brightness. If you get in there and your contrast and stuff, it's not, um, it's not making a difference, then you need to, you're going to have to get in and uh, check sub brightness and sub contrast if that's something that is even there and usually uh, when you get to a crt if it is there it's going to be in the form of uh, a potentiometer inside the te tv or it's going to be software manipulated through a setting so if you first go through and your standard brightness and contrast won't get this up won't get this visible because the goal here is you pull up this pattern and it's very difficult to see i don't know why i can't get this let me see if i can zoom this picture in why i'm having so many issues with my view not letting me zoom um i'm not sure what's going on there i don't even really know how to use these tabs there we go all right it's not even doing anything interesting i press zoom and it does nothing Gotta love Google Chrome, right? That's a piece of junk. Anyway, if you look in these schedule or this this section of black, and you might not be able to see it on my screen, I'm sorry, but if you look at this pattern, there's black uh, cubes down here. One of those cubes has three lines in it, and you just want to have it set to where those three lines are basically barely visible. Okay, barely visible. So again, and then if you can't get anything out of those adjustments, if you can't get anything out of those first adjustments and then you move on, you're not getting anything else out of the other adjustments, then the only thing left to do is to try to increase the G2 voltage, which is the screen brightness potentiometer. And nine, nine times out of 10, that's on your uh, flyback transformer. So it'll be marked with screen. You can go in there and crank that up a little bit. If you crank it up to where you see retrace lines on the tube, like vertical, or I mean horizontal, diagonal lines, and you start seeing it bloom out. It's too high. You have to back it back down a little bit, and that's the best way. Um, you may have either a weak tube or flyback, or you may have circuits that are worn out, or components in the circuits that are worn out for the color controls. So there's components there. If they're dried out capacitors, it's preventing that contrast and uh brightness to go up 
it's basically that kind of a process. Um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, overclockwise. Thank you. Yeah, you might want to just check. Just take a quick spin. It's not going to be painful or harmful to that TV to spin that wheel a little bit. See if it comes up. It might come up and look perfect. And that's all that's happened is it had a G2 voltage drift and it's gone down over time. And it needs to be cranked up a little bit. That's very common. It's like anything. After time, it needs to be readjusted. So, let me uh, close that out. Get back here. Thank you, everybody, again today. And I really appreciate all your um, wonderful comments. And thank you again. I know it's some a, a super chat. That's awesome. I appreciate it. And again... You guys have enjoyed the show just a simple like always is helpful um andre it is normal if nothing else happens if the tally light just blinks once if the tally light just blinks it's not a problem it just blinks on and off now if it like blinks i've never seen one that just sits there and like blinks if it keeps doing it it might have something that it's code that it's saying is wrong but all right, guys, this is we're going to stop. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Monday. Sorry I won't see you Thursday with the live show, but I'll figure something out. And, you know, just keep your notifications on, and um, you'll see something. Have a great rest of your week, and I will at the latest see you next Monday in the next episode of The Bunker, uh, where I'll have something else planned. We'll definitely have some returning segments. We're going to have a new piece of electronics to get through. I'll see you guys then. You have a great rest of your week. Thank you again. And I'll see you next time.